Welcome to the first Magic and Medicine episode of the Three Ravens podcast, a series all about superstitious spells, crazy charms, and some downright revolting remedies. <laughs> I'm Eleanor Conlon, and I'm peering over my bubbling cauldron and stirring in some potent herbs, and my co-host Martin Vaux is wrestling an unsuspecting toad, which he's going to throw in and join me. Hello, this toad does not want to be boiled for some reason. I can't think why that could possibly be. <laughs> So, as anyone who listens to the main series of Three Ravens will know, I am fascinated by the history of magic and the line where it crosses into medicine, Mm -hmm. where people become so desperate for a cure for their physical ailments that they resort to supernatural means. (laughs) There's also a definite crossover with kind of religion and the realms of prayer and kind of magical thinking, isn't there? Yes, they're all connected. It's really important to remember that for centuries, the existence of God and the survival of the soul occupied the daily lives of everyone in England. So it's impossible to get away from religion, even when we talk about magic. So, Eleanor, what magical mysteries are we going to be talking about today? We're going to start our rummage through the haunted antique shops of history in search (laughs) of cursed objects with one of the most evocative items in folk magic's history. Which one? The witch bottle. The what now? Is that... When Mother Shipton had a really bad day and kind of walked into her local pub with a dark cloud (laughs) over her head and the bartender reaches below the bar for the extra strong stuff. Oh, we're going to need the witch bottle today, lads. (laughs) That's a different kind of witch bottle, but probably (laughs) just as effective in that specific situation. (laughs) No, the witch bottles we're going to be exploring today are a kind of apotropaic magic. What? Which means evil averting. Apotropaic? That's right, it comes from Greek. The basic idea is that you fill a bottle or a jug with a series of ingredients, seal it up and hide it in your home to prevent being bewitched. Ah, yes. Uh, When we were quite early in our relationship, you made me one of these for the flat I was living in. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Ingredients do vary, and I should say I included none of these, but they can include pins, needles, thorns and other sharp objects, herbs, teeth, nail clippings, urine and red wine. Ooh, that sounds like a pretty unpleasant cocktail. It does. And there's even an account of a historian opening and tasting the contents of wine. Well, apparently he thought he was tasting wine with a hint of rusty nails, (laughs) but later analysis proved it to be urine. (laughs) Poor man. Oh, I feel like if you taste the contents of random centuries-old magic bottles and don't like the outcome, it's kind of on you, really. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I have a feeling this is about to be our first don't try this at home warning of the series. <laughs> anyway, we've definitely discussed other forms of household protective magic in our mainline episodes, yes. including the pinning of horseshoes over the front door of the house and the burying or hiding of shoes. Oh, so many houses we visited, historic houses and stuff, where they've got the old shoes that people hid in the wall cavities. Yes. Very interesting. I also read that brooms should be placed outside the front door to stop witches from entering. Uh, Okay. As apparently they feel compelled to count all the individual bristles before coming in. Some seriously OCD witches <laughs> there. Presumably giving you the time to slip out the back and escape. <laughs> now, we talked about mummified cats in the Shropshire episode, and they fit into that too, don't they? They do, and I love their feature in your Dick Whittington story. Oh, thank you. We're also familiar, aren't we, with the inscribing of witch marks around entrances, including doors, windows and the hearth in particular. Oh, yeah. Any old house that you go to, always have a look at the uh, fireplace and the surround and also above the door frames because there's almost always something scratched into them. Daisies often, or the yes, kind of figure that looks like a daisy. we saw some great ones at the priest house in um, East Hope, like Yeah, we did, yeah. An amazing place to visit, very haunted, supposedly. Where all the volunteers were like, it's definitely not haunted. No, 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 stop spreading rumours about <laughs> well, it. Well, the ghosts just sort of <laughs> dance the can-can behind them. <laughs> but the, um, the putting of witch marks around the chimney, in particular in the hearth, expressed beliefs that witches often gained access to homes through deviant paths. Ooh. So not the door, basically. Yeah, okay, that's and the chimney stack, particularly. Yeah, another thing that we have seen is people laying like molten iron across their doorways yes, to stop to put witches entering because iron is supposed to repel witches as well. Hence the horseshoes, of course. Yes. Yes. 
I must say, the idea of evil coming down through the fireplace has always captured my imagination slash absolutely terrified me. <laughs> There's a fairy tale by George MacDonald, which for some reason I loved as a child, in which the witch reaches down the chimney with a long spindly arm towards the baby's cradle. Oh, they like that. <laughs> <laughs> so back to witch bottles. Yeah, okay. uh, they should have had one in that chimney. <laughs> we have a wealth of evidence of witch bottles being used to avert and divert evil practices. There are 13 primary accounts from the 17th century alone. Ooh. But the use of witch bottles kept going well into the 20th century, as you'll hear. OK, all right, I'm excited. What have you got, Eleanor? Inform we me. We have a ballad, a text by an astrologer doctor, uh -huh. accounts of witchcraft trials, four religious texts which argue against the use of witch bottles oh. and a couple of miscellanies which are kind of compendiums of recipes, yeah. cures and great advice including money saving tips. Really? Yeah, they were like the money saving expert <laughs> of the 17th century. In the Victorian era, miscellanies became a bit more about compendiums of bits of poems. They like yes. took the highlights out. Collecting nice things yeah. that you liked. Um, but in the 16th and 17th century, they were more Kind of like an almanac, a day book, sure, a yeah. place to shove in your recipes and useful tips you picked up over the years. Okay, but so do any of these survive, these old texts? Uh, yes, they do. Oh, how and exciting. That's how we have these accounts. And how about old witch bottles? Do any of those survive? Yes, actually. Um, about 100 bottles have been found, nah. mostly in England and New England. Um, obviously, a lot of people from England moved to America yeah. and kept their practices up there. Although more get found fairly regularly, mostly by builders who are either demolishing or restoring historic buildings and sites ranging from houses, churchyards, ditches and riverbanks. Whoa, this is so interesting. Then, yeah, because the bottles were intentionally concealed, they only come to light when sites are excavated. Oh. So we're still finding them all the time. I wonder if the fact that they were secretly placed has anything to do with the kind of anti-witchcraft fervour of the 16th and 17th centuries. Well, that stands to reason, doesn't it? Yeah. I find that pretty interesting and ironic because people would use the bottles because they were scared of yeah. the influence of witches. But if you were discovered to own one, they look pretty witchy. You'd probably be <laughs> arrested for witchcraft, the very witchcraft you were trying to ward off. So the next time I'm doing some DIY and I find a strange bottle in the walls, how should I know if... It's a witch's bottle. They contain a combination of ingredients, like the ones I mentioned earlier, yeah. and they're usually made of glass, but there are some examples which are made of pottery and look more like jugs. Okay. Some of these have the severe head of a bearded man on them, Ooh. and these are known as Bellamines, after Cardinal Robert Bellamine, who was a Catholic cardinal involved in rooting out heresy and witchcraft. <sighs> he was responsible for the condemnation of Giordano Bruno in 1600 and was also involved in the trial of Galileo. Now, I think I'm right in saying that Giordano Bruno was another wizard from the Renaissance era. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you are right. Okay, and good. they seem to be cropping up for us quite a lot recently, as we just talked about Michael Scott in the yeah, Cumberland episode. Making their presence known. They are. I wonder if it's a sign. <laughs> well, Bruno was a little more respectable than Scott. Oh, okay. um, he was a highly educated man and a really prolific writer. The list of books he authored in his lifetime is a Astounding. So what kind of things did he write about? A huge range of subjects, mainly philosophy, science. He, we probably would have called him a scientist today. Yeah. In the Enlightenment, he would have been referred to as a natural philosopher. Which I think is a title and term that we've lost to our detriment. It's a real shame, isn't it? Yeah. I'd love to say I'm a natural philosopher. All of these people calling themselves scientists. Call yourself natural philosophers. Yeah. It's much more interesting. Associate yourself with Victor Frankenstein. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> now... Bruno might not have been executed today, although his passion for free thinking and forbidden books still might have him answering some pretty awkward question in the dean's office yeah. at the university. Uh, and let me guess, his encounters with the Catholic Church, I guess, was like church one, Bruno zero. Correct. <laughs> he was actually burned at the stake in 1600 Ooh. due to his views on the afterlife, magic and theories of the cosmos. Well, as Copernicus would tell us, Pointing out that the sun is at the centre of the universe in Renaissance Italy, that's like not a good thing to do, I guess. N not the best decision. <laughs> and Bruno's theories definitely included heliocentrism. Uh -huh. His fate was actually rather worse than just being burned. He was hung upside down naked in the town square for quite a while. Oh dear. And uh, his ashes were scattered in the Tiber. 
Ooh. So, uh, <laughs> Tiber Water today might contain a little bit of Bruno. <laughs> they really didn't like it when people disagreed, did they? The Catholic Church? No. No. <laughs> no. Luckily, they're so much more enlightened today. <laughs> actual evidence he met dr john d who is my absolute favorite historical yeah. magician it seems quite likely that he would have done because he lived and worked in england during the 1580s and certainly knew people who knew d like the poet philip sydney now am i right in thinking that simon foreman is around the same time as well yeah Simon Foreman is contemporaneous with Dr. D. Another fascinating and half-forgotten figure if you don't know anything about Simon Foreman. Have a little look. Still, I find it very interesting that you've said that these witch bottles are then associated with this cardinal. Like, he presumably would have hated that. He would. He would have preferred crucifixes on the walls, not witch bottles in the walls. What's his name again? <laughs> cardinal Bellamine. Bellamine. And the, these jugs with the, the man's cross face on are called Bellamines. Wow, that's him. so interesting. It is, isn't it? Now, interestingly, unlike other charms like horseshoes and witch marks, witch bottles don't seem to have been prepared as a random part of the average household's apotropaic armoury. Okay. They don't just generally protect your home and family on the off chance a witch may take a dislike to you. Yeah. They're actually incredibly specific created when you're already under an evil influence. No way! So you have to create a specific recipe to deal with a specific problem. Exactly. Ooh, I love this. Yeah. So it's like a prescription item rather than like your daily dose of vitamins. Exactly, and it is, it's <laughs> classed as a kind of medicine. No way. Although it sounds really witchy, it's important to remember that it's actually a facet of early modern healing and is situated within these medical and religious practices. Whoa. So the bottles often get prepared by a chemist who is a kind of all-purpose pharmacist-magician hybrid yeah. in your local area. And that's who, like with a Y, right? Yeah, chemist, chemist with a Y. Like Although an L chemist. I think the pronunciation is probably either or, chemist yeah. or chemist. Sure, sure. Because um, spelling's non-standardised, so we don't really know. And this person would diagnose you and conclude you were probably ill because you'd been bewitched. Now, am I right in thinking that there's also urine involved in this part of the process? Because, you know, from my reading, they used to measure your illnesses by the grade colour of your urine. Yes. <laughs> Urinary illnesses, infections were really common in the 16th yeah, and 17th century. So a lot of medicine had to do with urine. So it stands to reason the magical practices would also be connected to urine. And your urine in turn and the colours you've mentioned is connected to the four humours. Yeah. Definitely. And if you've got too much of something in your general makeup. Oh, my black bile, it's playing. Oh, my black bile, exactly. All right, so let's say I have been bewitched. I've peed into my bottle. I have given that to the chemist. He's then measured it. What's he going to say? What, what do I have to do? What do I have to sort of shove into my own witch's bottle? Well, typically your bottle would be filled with urine. Okay. Other personal effects <laughs> like hair, fingernail clippings or teeth, which might correspond to your affliction. So a tooth would be used if you were suffering from the toothache and so forth. Uh -huh. Although presumably they'd have to pull out another one of your teeth in order to put that in. Yeah. So I'm not sure how useful that well, really is. Maybe they just kept a stock of other people's teeth that they'd harvested yeah. to use for Although, yes, I'm I'm not sure if it's your tooth or just a tooth. <laughs> yes, one times tooth. That's, yes. that's part Grab of the, the cat, recipe. get his tooth. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of other sharp objects like pins, needles and thorns. Oh, why sharp? Well, this is because when the witch is attracted to the bottle, they yeah. would supposedly be impaled on oh, the sharp they get stuck. objects. They get stuck and, and caught on all the sharp objects. Oh. I also read that the pins were often bent. So they weren't just straight regular pins. They'd been deliberately bent. Oh. Because apparently this ritually killed the pins. Like, no. murdered the pin. <laughs> Meaning the pins then existed in the other world and like on another plane, which blown. a witch could use to travel to their victims. So the pins being dead would sort of become ghost pins <sighs> and could access the witch on an astral plane. I mean, this is incredible That's stuff, so isn't it? That's so interesting. And also, like, 
we are killing pens all the time when we're making costumes and stuff I know, and I them. feel horrible. <laughs> You're a pen I never murderer. knew I was a pen murderer. <laughs> and well, then these personal effects that were sort of meant to attract the witch to the bottle, where they then get impaled on the sharp things, no presumably way. killed in the astral realm of pin ghosts. <laughs> okay, so in real life, I have a chronic pain problem, right? So I have issues with my back. So what do I need in my witch's bottle to deal with my bad back, to get oh. rid of this demon or curse that I have? Yeah, that may be one for the osteopath or possibly the priest, <laughs> uh, the exorcist rather than the chemist. <laughs> it's certainly um, true. We've talked about urinary problems. Yeah. They were very common, yes. probably due to diet, water quality, but the symptoms got attributed to local witches really often. And, I, you know, we're talking a lot about pee here, but... <laughs> Yeah. Did witch's bottles always contain urine? Not always. Oh, okay. Later witch bottles were filled with rosemary, needles and pins and red wine. Oh, that's nicer. Yeah, and it, it sort of makes more sense. So the um, evil was meant to be captured and impaled on the pins, yeah. then drowned in the wine, oh. and then banished with the rosemary, which is this <sighs> cleansing herb. So once you've made this witch bottle, you've deployed it, you then just, what, get better straight away because oh, it's caught the evil? You should do, but the witch bottles have another interesting side effect as well. Okay, tell me, tell me. They enable someone who's been bewitched to reverse the spell cast on them, Ooh. diverting it back to the person who cast it. No way. So this really ties in with the theories of the Swiss natural philosopher Paracelsus, who we talk about fairly often. Yeah. I think Paracelsus is great if you're not familiar with his work. Please go and check him out. He talks a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> but he thought that the universe was a network of correspondences and all beings were connected. Yes. So any action brought about in the spirit of one affects the others. And that's kind of linked to Plato with the theory of the anima mundi. Yeah, basically. the soul of the world. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it still pops up in modern witchcraft practices today. Isn't yeah. The notion of balance and correspondence. Certain herbs have certain correspondences with the stars, with the sun, with what's going on with the phases of the moon, with uh, what day it is. There's so much. Uh, yeah, likewise, various different stones and semi-precious gems, different yes. elements in a tarot deck. Have Tar tarot tarot corresponding yeah. to crystals. Exactly. Like we still we still use all this stuff now. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's nice to think of Paracelsus's theories being upheld. And the thing about this science because I'm going to call it a science, but really natural, this natural, natural philosophy, philosophy is, uh, it all makes sense to me. There's a, there's a logic to it. Yeah, and plenty of people down the centuries have felt the same way. You yeah. can see why they really believed this stuff would work. Yes. Of course, in the 17th century, the idea of turning the affliction back at the witch who caused it made it a lot easier to accuse hapless people of witchcraft. Oh. As if someone else in the community suddenly manifests similar symptoms or maybe evidence of some scratch marks because they've been caught by the pins after the use of the witch oh bottle. They could easily be identified as the afflicting <sighs> witch. That's so interesting. And if, you know, everyone in your road has got a urinary infection, <laughs> it suddenly makes pointing the finger very easy. <laughs> I see you, Brenda, with your bad back. Now you know how it feels. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, suffering is gone, sent back to the source. Is well, it that simple? Sometimes that's all there is, but sometimes it's more. Uh -huh. So there's an account of a man going to the barber and asking to keep some clippings of his hair so he could put them in a bottle and heat it in the fire until it exploded, <laughs> thus killing the enemy who harmed him. <laughs> so yeah. like a magical assassination from afar. Yes, and this, oh. this reminds me of the dung spell we talked about yeah. in series one. It's a similar principle. There's another great one which suggests stirring your witch bottle over a fire in a darkened room. Well, who then, wouldn't? Yeah, then yeah. the witch who's harmed you will come to your door and bang on it, make a lot of noise and beg you to let her in. But if you take no notice and just completely keep yeah. silent, don't turn the lights on, keep stirring, uh -huh. the witch will burst. What? <laughs> She'll just like... Burst. Burst. Spontaneously <laughs> combust. I'm not sure that's a good idea. It sounds a bit messy to me. Very messy indeed. <laughs> but do you know what's really brilliant about those two stories? Yes. The haircut man is from 1903. What? And the recipe for bursting a witch was still known in a Norfolk village as late as 1939. Oh my God, this is so good. It seems amazing to me, doesn't it, that people were still hoping the malevolent influences in their lives could be literally exploded by stirring a bottle of pins right on the eve of the Second World War. Well, I've got to be 
I've got to be honest, I'm kind of wishing that we still believe that. I don't know. Let's run some experiments. We'll give it a go if you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this has all been fascinating, Eleanor. Thank you for explaining what a witch bottle is and how amazingly powerful and interesting they are. What will we be talking about next time in our next Magic and Medicines episodes? Well, light the candles and scatter the rose petals because next time we will be talking about love charms. Oh, so manipulating the feelings of others to, you know, correspond with your own desires. That doesn't sound morally dubious at all. We are definitely going to need to record that Try This at Your Own Whisk warning. <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, if you'd like more lovely bonus content, including all of our episodes completely ad-free, all the stories as text versions, special episodes, episodes of the Three Ravens Film Club, and our monthly newsletter with spells, tarot, folk customs, and more, please consider joining our Conspiracy of Ravens on Patreon for either $3 a month or $6 a month. And that's at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. Also, if you have the time to write us a quick review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please do. They really do make a difference. And we've got a lot going on via social media on facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast, Instagram at three ravens podcast, and Twitter at three ravens pod. We're not on threads yet, but watch this space. I'm still not totally sure what threads is, so well, we've we got better explore that. All over the carpet because you've been making Shh, skirts. Tell the world. <laughs> <laughs> we always love receiving your emails and artwork too, and this week we'd especially love to hear from you if you've had your own encounter with a witch bottle. Oh, yes, please. Email us at threeravenspodcast at gmail.com. Until next time then, while our bottle of nails has gone that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. Join us next week for another bonus episode, our first Three Ravens bestiary. Our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour, and our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man With a down, derry, 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 down, down